Well, good afternoon. Many people in this country have fond family memories of going to a zoo when they were a kid. They remember going to a zoo, they remember having fun with their family at the zoo. They may have been in awe of a magnificent species they saw at the zoo, or they may have been inspired by the diversity of wildlife they saw at the zoo. Some people trace their love of animals or love of wildlife to their visits to the zoo as well. But increasingly, more and more people are becoming uncomfortable with zoos. Your harshest of critics are saying, zoos are prisons for animals. They only exist for entertainment and for financial gains of institutions. And there's been a lot of negative press on zoos as well. Lots of negative headlines. Might be an oxymoron on negative press, but at this point, you're seeing a lot of negative press. And in two cases in particular, have really changed a lot of attitudes on zoos. First is the Blackfish documentary that reportedly shows abuse of orcas at your Sea World parks. Your second case is Harambe. Harambe was the male gorilla at the Cincinnati Zoo. A child jumped into the enclosure with Harambe, and ultimately the Cincinnati Zoo shot the gorilla to save the child's life. This is bringing up a lot of negativity. Now, one of the problems is the word zoo. Many people use the word zoo to encompass a lot. Everything from your roadside menagerie to even your gas station with a tiger in a cage is used in the same breath as the Bronx Zoo, San Diego Zoo, whatever your world-class establishments are. And that's truthfully very unfair. That's the equivalent of saying that all restaurants are the same greasy spoon, nastiest that you could ever imagine, compared to a Michelin three-star restaurant. Or that all movies are the same. Everything from the worst of Adam Sandler movies, if you will, all the way up to Gone with the Wind, Godfather, pick your movie. Not all, movie, not all movies are the same. Not all restaurants are the same, and not zoos. Not all zoos are the same as well. So how do you tell if a zoo is a good zoo? Well, one of the easiest way is the association of zoos and aquariums. I work at the Buttonwood Park Zoo, I'm the director of the Buttonwood Park Zoo, and I'm proud to say that I'm an accredited member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Now, for those of you who don't understand what the accreditation, or not familiar with the accreditation, they look at every aspect of what you do at a zoo. Animal care, veterinary care, financial, guest services, you name it. And there are only 231 accredited zoos in all of North America. And when you consider there's 3,000 wildlife exhibitors in North America, that tells you something. What it tells you is that there are some good zoos out there, and there's some really, really bad zoos as well. So what is the role of a modern zoo? What should a modern zoo be focused on? Well, the first thing I would say is a connection with nature. Well, what does that mean? More and more people are disconnected with nature, particularly children. Many studies show this. My youth, many people in this room, remember summer break. Get up in the morning, you eat breakfast, you run outside to find your friends so that you can wreak havoc in the neighborhood. Okay? You spend all day outside, oftentimes in natural areas. You're exploring. You're using your creation, creativity. You're using your imagination. Sure, you go home at lunch, mom sews you back up, you go back out afterwards. Anyone who spent time around children today realized that this right here is not the experience of today's youth for the most part. This is much more realistic. Studies have shown that children today spend anywhere from six and a half to seven hours a day in front of some type of digital screen, and only a few minutes a day outside exploring nature. And why is that? Well, one, we live in much more of an urban environment. More people live in cities than live in rural areas, less natural areas. Another reason is parental fear, stranger danger. Parents are not comfortable with their children wreaking havoc through neighborhoods. <laughs> Maybe a good thing, but that's okay. And they're sometimes not even comfortable they're playing in the front yard without being attended. Let's also look at more parents are working. So what happens after school? They go to after-school programs, indoors, oftentimes. Weekends, 
soccer practice, piano practice, much more structured existence. So more and more people are becoming disconnected to zoos, excuse me, disconnected to nature. So what the heck does this have to do with zoos, okay? Although there are more negative feelings towards zoos, more and more people are going to zoos. Attendance is through the roof. Those 231 zoos that I keep referring to, those accredited zoos that I was referring to earlier, they have an attendance of 180 million people last year. That's more than the NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, and NFL combined. People come to zoo. <clears throat> In part, they're coming to zoos is for that nature connection, to connect with nature, to connect with wildlife. Zoos be ready to have inspirational moments for the children that are coming to the zoo when they get there. So what else? What else would a zoo be focused on? How about environmental education programming? If you are lucky enough to have a zoo, a accredited zoo in your community that is doing environmental education programming, they've got some of the best programming you could ever imagine. And there's a reason we cheat. We cheat really bad because we have this. Okay? Science teachers in class, magnificent science teachers in this community, I'm sure in most communities, teaching about anatomy, physiology, biology, zoology, animal behavior, what have you. You take that program and you teach it at the zoo, or you augment it by a visitor to the zoo. How much more meaningful is that program when you can see the animals you're talking about, when you can smell, when you can hear? I'm going to tell you a quick story. A couple years ago, I hire a new curator of education, Carrie Hawthorne, who happens to be in the room now. I'm sure she's turning red. Okay. So it's about a week in, and she's getting ready to do an after-school program over at OSS. OSS is our sister school. If you're not familiar, um, it's a school that caters or attracts at-risk middle school girls. So she's getting ready to go over and do this program. And I say to her, what animals are you bringing over for this program? We usually will bring an owl, a hawk, so that's expecting for an answer. She looks me square in the eye, and she says, earthworms. Okay, ask for a second time, earthworms. Two things happen at this point. One, I seriously started questioning how the curative education could think that earthworms were appropriate representation of the zoo after an after-school program. The second thing, I seriously questioned my own hiring ability to hire a curator who thought that earthworms were appropriate representation of the zoo. So she goes off, she does her education program at our sister school. She comes back, I ask her, how'd your program go? And I'm sure knowing me, I was very snarky about it. I said, how'd your program go? She goes, well, in the first 10 minutes or so, students, you know, as middle school girls have a tendency to do, be a little bit loud, a lot of ooh, icky, what have you. But after a while, this is what happens. They're holding the worms. They're gentle with the worms. The worms are crawling through their hands. And they start asking questions like, where worms come from? Bear with me. <laughs> How do worms eat? How do worms reproduce? Always fun for a middle school question. Um, and what is my point to this? Actually, let me go back one. It really shouldn't be surprising that these girls had this reaction. They're coming from the north end. They're coming from the south end. They're not living in natural areas. They're not out fishing on weekends, putting worms on hooks. They're not out running through the woods, lifting logs, looking for worms, looking for insects. So why wouldn't they be inspired by this? So it tells us two things. One, Carrie Hawthorne knows a hell of a lot more about environmental education than I do. And secondly, if you have that level of reaction for a bunch of earthworms, not that there's anything wrong with earthworms, what's the reaction to this? How much can you inspire them with this? So what are some other roles of a modern zoo? How about environmental stewardship? Same scenario, teacher, let's make it apparent. Parents encouraging their child to recycle. Usually it's the other way around, but let's just go with the story, okay? So parents trying to encourage their child to recycle. Let's take that same lesson and bring them to the zoo. Okay, that's Ruth, 58-year-old Asian elephant, the Buttonwood Park Zoo. Beautiful animal, wonderful animal. So the child's standing in front of this elephant, and she can hear it, smell it, touch it. No taste, touch it, okay? And she's in front of this animal. And you start talking about it, ch child. <laughs> you need to recycle. And the reason you need to recycle is because part of the paper products you're using are coming from the forest of Asia. And if you want species like Ruth and Emily, 
to survive on this planet, we need to save their habitat. What other environmental education messages or environmental stewardship messages? How about this? This child's probably too young to remember this when he gets older, but I guarantee its parents are going to remember it. Um, and this is probably too older message, but when you get older and you start parent, hey, that magnificent tiger you saw at the zoo, you realize it's a legitimate chance this animal is going to go extinct in the wild, and that's not, that's just not a stretch of imagination. This particular species is only 350 left in the wild. And you pair it with stuff like this, not to get all doom and gloom, sorry, um, but when you pair it with stuff like this, are you more motivated to vote for laws that restrict this type of behavior? Are you more motivated when traveling abroad not to buy souvenir products like this? Other examples, see a sea turtle in an aquarium, see a pelican at a zoo. You think you're more likely to vote against or vote for changes in the way netting is done with fishing industry? Or are you going to be more responsible at your fishing line and your hooks? Feed a bird at the zoo. Mom, we need to keep our cat indoors. One of the major killers of songbirds in this country is the domestic cat. So this is what I mean from an environmental stewardship standpoint. So what else? What else should a modern zoo be involved in? Okay? How about conservation of threatened and endangered species? This is near and dear to my heart. Okay? One of the arguments I get on zoos all the time is that animals belong in the wild. And you know what? In a perfect world, I completely agree with you. But here's the problem. We don't live in a perfect world. Okay? Carrie Hawthorne, the um, earthworm guru, um, she talks, do not use doom and gloom statistics. It drives people away, Keith. Don't do it. So I'm going to use a doom and gloom statistic. Okay? <laughs> Half of the forests on this planet are gone. Okay? And we continue to cut them at a rate 10 times greater than we could ever regrow them. Half the forests are gone, and we keep cutting them at unsustainable rates. So when people say, animals don't belong in zoo, they should be in the wild. Is it this wild? How about this wild? Okay. So what are zoos are doing about this? Well, first off, those 231 zoos that I talked about, the accredited zoos, last year alone we raised $130 million for wildlife conservation in the field. Help protect animals. Even Little Buttonwood Park Zoo. We have programs that we're saving endangered species of butterfly. We're helping fund projects in Vietnam to save Asian elephants. We're working to save seals. Working to save even great white sharks. We'll even study and, save and protect great white sharks. Okay? We have wildlife rehabilitation programs. Even small Buttonwood Park Zoo here in New Bedford is involved in wildlife conservation. So what else? How about reintroduction programs? Now, I'll tell you right off the bat, reintroduction programs are very challenging. They're expensive, and success rates are low. And one of the major factors is there's a reason that you're doing a reintroduction program, whether the animal became extinct in the wild because of habitat loss, pollution, pollution, you name it. But if you can do it, if you can start these breeding programs, it does make a difference in saving some of these species on the planet. And zoos increasingly are involved in these types of programs. This beautiful species, golden lion tamarind, this is a species that was down to 200 in the wild in the 1980s, in Atlantic coastal forests of Brazil. Today, they're at 3,500 because zoos bred them and reintroduced them. And two-thirds of the animals in the wild are traceable back to those zoo animals. One other example, just in North America alone, California condor. This doesn't exist without zoos doing breeding programs and reintroduction programs. Black-footed ferrets. Red wolf in the Carolinas. Wyoming toad, for you amphibian lovers out there. I even got to be involved in programs myself. This cute little mouse species, Perdido Key beach mouse, I was involved in breeding programs to help breed them and reintroduce them into the beaches of Florida and Alabama. You want to talk about challenge? Try to tell a developer that they can't build their mega mansion on the beach because of the endangered beach mouse. Okay. But this is what zoos are more and more doing. So what else? How about biological reserves? What do I mean by that? Do you realize there are animals in zoos today that no longer exist in the wild? Okay? One of the biggest problems with zoos is we don't have space. We don't have enough space for the amount of animals that are going or becoming endangered or going extinct. We just don't have enough space. We play God. 
We choose what species we can work with, truthfully based on our belief of success, but this is what happens. So this is the reality of what we live in, and this is the role of a modern zoo. So what else? How about scientific research? A lot of people don't realize that zoos are riddled, riddled is the wrong word to use, are full of scientists, riddled with scientists, depends on the day, are full of scientists, okay? And they look at everything, animal behavior. Lots of what we know about animals have been studied in zoos. How about veterinary medicine, wildlife diseases? There are seven billion people on this planet. They keep encroaching in wild, wild habitats where wild animals exist. Do you know what happens when you do that? You get zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that pass from the animal to the person. You want some examples? I don't know, let's try Ebola. How about SARS, avian influenza, okay? West Nile virus, something we deal with here in Massachusetts, you get the alerts all the time, West Nile found in a sentinel chicken, what have you. Do you realize that the Bronx Zoo Pathology Department is the one who discovered that West Nile virus was in Western Hemisphere? They started seeing crows drop from the sky around the parks of the Bronx Zoo, and they put two and two together and discovered what everyone else was calling Eastern encephalitis was actually West Nile virus, a new disease for our hemisphere. So these are the roles of zoos. So what other science are zoos involved with? How about this one? Gamete cryopreservation. <laughs> Storage of sperm, eggs in a frozen state. That's how it used to be, the frozen zoo. Honestly, we don't do that as much anymore. It's mostly DNA now. With the advances, advances of science, it is mostly focused on DNA right now. Zoos, like the San Diego Zoo, monster zoos, they have species in their frozen zoo, frozen specimens, of species that have gone extinct on this planet. They only exist, their DNA, in a frozen state in some medical lab in the San Diego Zoo. That's reality of the world we live in today. So what other areas we are we looking at? There's a lot of different science. Reproductive assistance or reproductive technologies embryo transfer, in vitro fertilization. Do you realize there are zoos right now that are taking rhinos? Common, more common species of rhinos, if you believe that actually exists. But a more common species of rhino, the southern white rhino, and they're implanting embryos, implanting rarer species of rhinos, and using those rhinos as surrogates. They're doing it with domestic cats for small wild species of felines. This is some of the technologies that zoos are working on. Earlier this summer, the Bunnewin Park Zoo put together a new master plan that is completely going to reshape how we manage the zoo and what the zoo is going to exist of. We have reinvented the zoo here in New Bedford. And our goal, not ambitious at all, is to be one of the best small zoos in the world. That's what our goal is. And how are we going to measure the goal? Well, I can tell you. Here's how we're going to measure the goal. First, we're going to be the place where parents in the community bring the children to connect with nature. Secondly, when they're at the zoo, they're going to sign up for the education programs because they realize how inspiring these programs are. And they're going to keep coming to the zoo because when they're at the zoo, their children go home and they want to help wildlife. They're inspired to help wildlife. And we're going to be synonymous with conservation of threatened and endangered species. And lastly, many ch children in the community they're going to want to be scientists because they went to the zoo and they saw the science going on and they want to be a veterinarian, they want to be a zoo director, they want to be a wildlife biologist because they want to protect wildlife. That is how we're going to determine if the zoo is successful. That is how we're going to determine if we are a modern zoo. Thank you.